So definition of a rational function, it's called rational function because it's a ratio of polynomials. And ratio is also known as a fraction. Definition a rational function. is a ratio of polynomials and can be written as, I'm going to use uh, r of x whenever I can for the name of rational functions. I use p of x a lot for the name of polynomial functions. So we're going to have a polynomial in the numerator and another polynomial. I'll use q of x for the other polynomial in the denominator. So where p and q are polynomials. <coughs> So what do you know about polynomials? We just did a whole chapter on polynomials. So you know how to find x-intercepts, also known as zeros, and you know how to factor them. And you know about crossing, bouncing, and end behavior. So what we're going to do now is basically expand that into rational functions. So we're going to take what we already know about polynomials and look at how rational functions behave. So let's start out with a domain question. So we've answered these types of questions before. So just looking at the form of rational functions, is it possible we might be dividing by 0? Yes. It's very possible. So you're going to look in the denominator and figure out when is that polynomial going to equal 0. There are no square roots or other roots in polynomials, so they, uh, looking for negative even roots, that's not going to happen in a polynomial. So we're just looking to make sure we don't divide by 0. So our example here All right, so find this domain. All you need to do is figure out there's some x values that make the denominator 0. So I want you to write down as many as you can. Some of them are really obvious, some of them a little bit less obvious. So we've used a zero product property before. You can also think about it as factors correspond to zeros. So we're looking at this factored, and we can see uh, some of the zeros right away. So you should have gotten x equals 3 as one of the zeros. Do I get any zeros out of this x squared plus 1 factor? So I got minus 1 equals x squared, so x equals plus or minus square root negative 1, which is plus or minus i. So if we think about when I would graph this function, remember your graphing with your x-axis is the real numbers, and your y-axis is the real numbers. So when we graph, complex zeros don't show up as x-intercepts. So only real zeros are going to show up as x-intercepts. So <coughs> These do not count for uh, 
in the domain. So our domain is only the real numbers, so there are not complex numbers in the domain. What about the last factor, x squared minus 1? So you should be able to see that positive 1 is a, is a 0 here. What other number is a 0? Negative 1. Negative 1. Two ways to see that. I could solve for x, just add 1, square root, or I could factor. How do I factor x squared minus 1? And I can write it as x squared minus 1 squared. So those are conjugates, x minus 1, x plus 1. So we got x equals 1 or x equals negative 1. So there's our plus minus 1. All right, so there's three x values I need to avoid. So I'm going to choose every other x value. So a number line can help out here. We got minus 1, don't use that. Positive 1, don't use that. And positive 3, so we're skipping all those. So I definitely use open intervals at infinity and negative infinity. What about this uh, negative 1? Is it OK to include negative 1? Should I go closed or open? open. open. So I've got to go open. If I went closed, I would not be excluding negative 1. So we're going open. So we're making sure we don't include negative 1, don't include 3. And if you like to draw your interval out on the number line, it looks like this. One nice way to think about how many pieces or how many intervals you're going to get. Oops, I just made a mistake. I did the same thing. What did I do? You didn't add an interval between one and three. One and three, there we go. <laughs> All right, so that's another good reason to use number line. So we got three pieces we're removing. A good way to think about this is if you're cutting up something like a carrot or a celery stick and you make three cuts, how many pieces do you have? You don't have three pieces, you actually have four. So we better include, I want to keep my intervals in order. So I'm going to erase, go 1 to 3, now 3 to infinity. So there is our domain. So again, we've had this type of problem before. I've asked you domain questions, but now they're going to include polynomials. So figuring out when is a polynomial 0, and then take all the other x values. So our next example, we're going to graph a function. We'll go with 1 over x squared. Using the clueless method. So what does the clueless method involve? Yeah, just basically picking x values, finding y values, and plotting those up. What is the one x value I should not use here? So don't use zero. So I'll build my table up. I'm going to write down zero in the middle, but I'm going to cross it out because I want to make sure I avoid using zero. So here are the values I want you to use. We'll do negative two, negative one, and negative one-tenth, and we'll use the same positive values, which are positive one-tenth, positive one, and positive two. So figure out these y values and plot them.
So on my graph, I can't even fit in the two points with y value 100. So we're going to connect these points together. But we have to be very careful. If I go from this point, negative, uh, when x is negative 1 to x is positive 1, I'm not allowed to cross the y-axis, because we just said x cannot be 0. So if I go to connect these in any way like this, I would not be allowed to cross the y-axis. So we'll deal with that in a minute. Isn't the negative 2 1 fourth supposed to be? Oh, yeah. These are in the wrong spot. What symmetry will this graph have? Y axis, yes. So technically, I could just graph the positive x values and then flip it over with the mirror image. That would be another option. All right, so we'll connect the adjacent points together. All right, what happens after I, let's go to the right. We'll go to the right of positive 2. What ha would happen to my y values if I keep making x bigger and bigger? Get smaller and smaller. It gets smaller quickly. If I just think of 3, 1 over uh, 3 squared is a ninth. So that's really small. So it gets small very quickly here. So it's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Is it ever going to actually uh, have a y value of 0? No. It will never have a y value of 0, even when x gets really big. However, it gets very close to 0. So the way that we describe that on the graph is called an asymptote. So we're drawing a asymptote here. A lot of people like to use highlighters for their asymptotes. So I'll switch. So if I use a highlighter, my asymptote's the horizontal line y equals 0. If you do not have a highlighter, I recommend you make it a dotted line, kind of like this. And you just draw the curve getting close to that dotted line. So are there any questions about when x is getting really big, y is getting very small? Now what we're going to do is think about what happens when x is between 0 and 1. So we're going to start at that point and then move to the left and think about what happens to our graph. So what are happening to y values? We already figured out one y value, which was 100. I'm going to just put a point up there. It's way up high when x is 1 tenth. Obviously, 100 is way higher than I marked on my graph. So the y values are basically increasing as you're uh, making your x values smaller. So they keep going up and up and up. We said x can never equal 0. The y values get bigger and bigger, but they never actually, uh, you never get an x coordinate of 0. So there is another asymptote. This one is different. This is a vertical asymptote. So we have a vertical asymptote here. And what the other asymptote was y equals 0. What is the name of this vertical asymptote right here? x equals 0. So this is our x equals 0. So every x, co x coordinate on this line will be 0. So that is x equals 0. Now I'm just going to use the y symmetry, y axis symmetry that we get, flipping the graph over and finish drawing it. We get another horizontal asymptote. You don't need to label it twice. I already have the y equals 0 labeled on the right side. So I don't need to label this on the left side. All right, so we just graphed our, well, this is not our first rational function. We also graphed the 1 over x function before. So this is our second rational function we've graphed. So let's describe the end behavior from just looking at the graph. So 
So we'll draw a cloud. And what's happening if I look to the right? I'm approaching y equals 0. And if I look to the left, I'm also approaching y equals 0. So the end behavior is going to look like this. So what you're going to find is there are some new end behaviors you have to pay attention to. So there were four end behaviors from polynomials. It was always going up or down on the sides. Rational functions could go up or down on the sides. They also can go horizontal. So this rational function is going to go horizontally when x goes uh, far to the right and far to the left. So I want you to graph this function g, but I want you to use transformations. So you have the base function right above, and there's two transformations happening. Which transformations are occurring in this g function? So what's our horizontal? Um, right 2. So we're going to go right 2. That's the minus 2. And what about vertical? So we got up one. So I want you to think about the vertical and horizontal asymptotes. What happens when you shift the graph right one and up one? How do they change? And take your four points that are labeled right here. You actually can be a little lazy and just use two points. These ones are going to be more annoying to move. So do your best to redraw that graph with the transformations. So when you shift the graph right, that is going to move your vertical asymptote to the right. So what is the new equation for this vertical asymptote? x equals 2. So just like before, you just take all your x coordinates, or in this case your line, and you just add 2 to all the x values that you see. So this one used to be 0, so now it moves to the right 2. There's two other x values I could pay attention to, which are negative 1 and 1. And shift those to the right. So we're now using 1 and 3. So there's our graph shifted to the right. Now I'm going to do the final graph, shift it up 1. This is our full function, 1 over x minus 2 squared plus 1. Which asymptote is going to move? Uh, horizontal. So our horizontal, <laughs> we're just adding 1 to the y coordinate. So it used to be 0, now it's going to be 1. Our vertical asymptote stays right where it is, x equals 2 still.
and there is our graph. So this is just connecting together uh, transformations and the non-clueless method of graphing. So let's look a little more carefully at vertical asymptotes. We'll do look, consider those first. We use the same letters as before. R of x is going to be P of x over Q of x. So vertical asymptotes, they're going to be uh, x equals a when q of a equals 0. Or another way to think about it, when a is a 0 of the denominator. So those are going to be vertical asymptotes. You also have to be sure that p of a is not 0. And there's going to be two types of vertical asymptotes. So just like before, we're going to have crossing and bouncing. And crossing is odd order. And bouncing is even. So this is just like x-intercepts, where the odd ones are crossing, and the even ones, if you see it two or four or six times, is going to bounce. Now, of course, asymptotes look a lot different than, than uh, x-intercepts. So I'll draw two vertical asymptotes. And I'll draw two more example asymptotes down here. All right, what does it mean to have a crossing asymptote? It means on one side, you're going to approach the top. And on the other side, you're going to approach the bottom. Of course, it could be flipped around. You might be approaching the bottom from one direction and the top from the other. So this is what it means to cross. You're going from the positive side to the negative side. And what does it mean to bounce? That was what we just had in our graph. They both are going up, or they're both approaching on the bottom. So I knew I was going to have a bounce intercept on the function we just graphed because I see x minus 2 squared right there. So the fact that it's squared means it's going to be bouncing there. And you can see the same thing happening on our original graph. This may look a little strange. You can write it. It's a little bit silly to write it like this, but it might make it look a little more obvious. So it looks a lot like our other zeros. So this is going to be a uh, order 2 uh, x equals 0 factor. So that's why this one bounced. And now we're going to look at end behavior. So end behavior is going to be a little bit more tricky. So for end behavior, we do need to look at both is your coefficient positive or negative, and also there are now two degrees that we need to look at. So there's a numerator degree and a denominator degree, and both of them are important. So I'm going to write out expanded forms. So we have a n x to the n, a n minus, minus 1, x to the n minus 1, plus a1x plus a0. Now my other polynomial
polynomial, I can't reuse A, so I'm going to go with B. And if I write it like this, I'm making a big assumption about my degrees. So if I use the letter N, what assumption am I going to make? Would I be making about the degrees of these polynomials? They're the same. So they don't have to be the same. You can have a lower degree on the denominator. You can have a higher degree on the denominator. You can have the same degree. So I'm just going to use M. So all of my subscripts and superscripts will have M's in them. So the n behavior is entirely determined by the highest power, but now there's a highest power in the numerator and a highest power in the denominator. So we're going to basically throw away all the other terms and just look at the highest powers here. So in polynomials, there was only one term you had to consider. Here you have to take the highest in the numerator, highest in the denominator. So we're just looking at a n x to the n over b m x to the m. I'm going to use a tiny bit of algebra. So we get one coefficient, which is the ratio of the two coefficients. The algebra rule I used here is when you divide, it's, the base is the same as subtracting powers. So this really depends on both that power, n minus m, and on whether the coefficient in front is positive or negative. So we're going to have more than four cases here. So let's take the polynomial case. So this will be a polynomial when n minus m is greater than 0. That is the same as saying n is greater than m. You just subtract m to the other side. It's the same inequality. So what happens when your numerator has a higher degree term than your denominator? This acts just like a polynomial. So we consider m minus n is odd, and now our coefficient is am over bm. If that's greater than 0, so this is odd positive, so they don't match, and it goes down on the left, up on the right. So same even uh, odd power, except this time if your coefficient is negative. Your end behavior looks like this. And you should be review. The terms look a little different, but it just goes off of even odd and positive or negative. So it's the same four end behaviors you saw with polynomials. We're going for even now. We'll go even positive first. So even means they match. And positive is up on both sides. So we go even negative. So they match, but this is down on both sides. 
So these are all the same as polynomials. So this should all be a review from last, the last few lectures when we looked at M behavior. So now we'll look at the cases that are not polynomials. So if we have equal degrees, meaning n minus m is 0, or you can think of it as m equals m, all right, what happens in this case? So in this case, n minus m is 0, so it's x to the 0 power, which cancels out to 1. Is that b of n or b of n? Oh, it should be an m in the denominator. Yeah. All right, so if they're equal, this is your horizontal asymptote. So if they're the same power, the same degree, then you have a horizontal asymptote. And this y value, whatever this number is, that's your horizontal line right there. And that's the exact y value of the horizontal asymptote. And that comes from the fact that algebraically, all the x's cancel out. They're the same number in the numerator and denominator. All right, so that's equal degrees. We looked at when the numerator wins. Now we're going to look at when the denominator wins. So that means n minus m is now negative or less than 0. So also known as m, uh, n is less than m. So we're looking at the same situation, a n over b m, x to the n minus m. So when it's written this way, you're looking at x to a negative power. So I like to think about x to positive power, so I'm going to write it as a reciprocal. So I'll write it as 1 over. And I'll distribute my negative sign. So if you change the order of m and n, that's the same as making the term negative. So we actually just had this situation occur. What happens when the denominator is, uh, has a higher power term? So let's think when x gets really big. And if you don't like uh, m minus n, I'll use the letter C. So look in this form. It's a little bit less going on. What happens when x gets really big? So let's say So another way to write x getting really big is you write x with an arrow infinity. So it's saying x is going towards infinity. So it's getting bigger and bigger. What is happening to this fraction? I'll zoom way, way in. What's happening to this fraction when x is a really big number? It's getting small. It's getting small. And it doesn't matter what number's in front over here. This could be a number like a million or a billion. But eventually, that x is going to be such a large value 
that even a billion times one over an even bigger number is going to get smaller and smaller. So no matter what the coefficient is, this is going to get very small. So y is going to approach 0. Now I don't like to think about uh, x approaching negative infinity as x getting small, because that usually when I think of small, I think going towards 0. So it's easy to write down in math notation. I want to think about x approaching negative infinity. So what happens when x is going really far to the left? You could write it, uh, you could write it in an, the other order, which would look like this. If that works better for you, you want to think about x going to the left towards negative infinity, you can write it like that as well. All right, let's think about a million. So one over a million to some positive power. All right. Oops, negative a million, sorry. So the smallest positive power would be one. So that would just be a really small negative number overall. What if this was a higher power, like two? That would be a one over a million squared. That's even smaller. And if the power is bigger, this becomes even smaller. So either way, uh, this is going to become smaller and smaller and smaller. So in this case, y is also going to approach 0. So you can just think about putting in big values in there, positive or negative, and your y value is going to get very small. All right, so either way, y is going to get close to 0. So what does our end behavior look like? I'll write that above a little bit here. So in this case, our end behavior, it looks similar to before, except in this case, y equals 0, not a n over b m. So this looks really similar to the previous cloud, except this previous version did not approach 0. It approached a number that was not 0. So there is one special case that I won't put on. You won't need to know this level of detail for your uh, midterm or quiz, but it will be on a homework problem or two. There's a special case. And it happens when n, the numerator degree, is exactly one more than the denominator degree. And n minus m is 1 in this case, so our n behavior is going to behave just like this. What type of function is this? Remember that AM, AN over BM is a constant. So it looks like a constant times x. What type of function is this? You were well acquainted with this type of function before you took this class. Linear function. Degree 1 polynomial, it's going to be a linear function. So the end behavior is going to be a line. And it's either a positive slope or a negative slope, depending on if your coefficient is positive or negative. So the special case, uh, so if you have a positive slope, it's going to have a diagonal asymptote. It's still up on the right, down on the left, so it still follows along with the regular pattern, except we can be a little more specific. Before, I just said, ah, up on the right, down on the left. But in this case, you can be very specific, and you know exactly uh, the way it goes up on the right, down on the left. It doesn't just go up in some curve, it goes out in a diagonal line. And if your ratio of coefficients is negative, it's really similar. It's just going to have a negative 
slope to this line. And in either case, you will get y equals an over bmx. And the other one's very similar, an over bmx. It's going to be a diagonal line. It's also known as oblique asymptote. So again, on a quiz or midterm in this class, I'm completely OK with you going for, it would be one of these two cases right here. You don't need that level of detail telling me exactly how it's going to go up and down in both directions. So it's just a special case of these two clouds. So you know enough information now that you can graph of rational functions. So that's exactly what we're going to do now. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to look, we're going to focus on end behavior because that's really the most tricky part of graphing these rational functions. There's a lot of choices on end behavior. So we're going to mainly focus on end behavior. So there's quite a few pieces of information we need to graph. We're going to get all the intercepts, x and y. We're going to get the vertical asymptotes. And we're going to get end behavior. I think that's all we really need to graph this. All right, let's go for uh, vertical asymptotes first. How do I find vertical asymptotes? You look at the leading terms. So that would be for end behavior. I look at leading terms. So vertical asymptotes, we'll go way back to where I define them, somewhere up here. Vertical asymptotes, here we are. So set the denominator equal to 0. You're basic, it's the same steps you do if you're asking for the domain. You're just basically telling me which x values should not go into this function. So we're intentionally setting the denominator equal to 0 and figure out what x values make it 0. 